friends, this is Trish and welcome to Teacher Therapy. Today I have a super exciting guest named Calvin Nellum. He is brilliant. He is a robotics teacher, a physics teacher. He works in Detroit. He teaches high school. He's a podcaster, a YouTube, and an all-around superhero and a brand new dad. So I want to welcome Calvin Nellum. How are you doing today, Calvin? I'm good. Thank you so much. So yeah. let's get warmed up. Let me just go ahead and ask you, uh, what got you interested in teaching in general? <laughs> research and science that was boring so i had to <laughs> i had to do something that i loved um so i was a career changer um i actually got into teaching because of a fellowship uh through the kellogg foundation formerly known as the Woodrow wilson fellowship where they take career changers you can be a science major specifically in like engineering you can work in engineering or you can just you know be a kid straight out of college and i was that kid straight out of college with a science degree in physics. Um, I didn't do education. I actually started my, you know, my college degree with education, but all those tests, I was like, no, I don't want to do that. So I did decide to do mathematics and physics. Um, and then my love, just like my passion started growing for just being with kids and doing science. And so I got into this fellowship and it was like, hey, if you teach in Detroit for five years, we'll pay for your master's, pay for your certification. You know what I'm saying? And I've been in Detroit for about seven years. So I think I'm I, th I think it's working out. <laughs> awesome. Well, I can relate to you because I, I kind of had a similar path. I went the Teach for America path and my original degree was youth ministry. So I knew that I would be working with youth and impacting the young people some way. But then I heard about Teach for America and I dove in and I had all kinds of surprises. So what about the actual teaching component? I know that for teachers, oftentimes classroom management is the number one thing that's really difficult and it takes a long time to master. So has that been your experience or did you just kind of take to it like a fish to water? Yeah, so, you know, I had a really great teacher prep program. I didn't do Teach for America. I did a different one where I had student learning was a one year. And, you know, we did the Teach Like a Teach like a Champion, Harry Wong, traditional, you know what I'm saying, books. Um, And then those have like their controversy now. They're not as like, you know, taboo or they're not as, what's the word, popular like they used to be. But classroom management was the number one priority. So I had to make sure I had procedures, make sure I had consequences, make sure I had some type of plan if, you know, my management, excuse me, if my instruction was to suffer because I wasn't able to have the right seating, right? Or I didn't do my do now properly. Um, but my biggest surprise was just being organized, right? So like handling the logistics, handling the paperwork, you know what I'm saying? I didn't, they did, I wasn't taught how to do that effectively. I was taught how to write a lesson plan. I was taught you know what I'm saying? How to do classroom management and the importance of it. But like all the other stuff, like, you know, I had to kind of just learn. I hear you. I'm just smirking because I remember losing field trip forms more than once. And I had a parent volunteer say, okay, like, where's the field trip forms? And I'm like, I don't know. So that organization thing is so real. Like it's something that seems so simple and intuitive because, you know, growing up, we watch our teachers and they look so organized, but then getting in the classroom and realizing just the volume of paperwork, it's, it's bananas. So so it's interesting that you mentioned Teach for a Champion and, you know, Harry Wong, the classics, because those, I love those. I, I love that style of classroom management. But in the last few years, at least since I've been in the classroom, there's been a big transition to more positive methods of working with students, more restorative practices. What has been your experience with those? Have you dealt with that? Or, you know, have you dealt with more traditional classroom management structures in the schools that you've worked in? Yeah, so I have experience in both. Um, you know, just my teaching in Michigan, you know, I've been at schools that were zero tolerance, you know, and I've been at schools that are just equity based. And I can honestly tell you, um, you know, if you're at a school that is in between or trying to go to the other or away from the other, it takes time. It takes time. You know, we needed a pandemic to happen to understand what equity was in its relationship to education. And then after the pandemic, we had to put it into practice. We just figured out what it was. You know what I'm saying? And so, <laughs> you know, just like just understanding that that like that takes time but then like eventually you get to the point where you have two sides where restorative justice becomes all oh, you're coddling the kids right that's that that becomes like a just what it gets perceived as when really it's like you are restoring something that got hurt where traditional teachers are very superior minded they don't have that equality mutual mindset and that's what restorative justice brings and so you have a lot of old teachers leaving the classroom because they don't want to seem as equal as the students now because that dominant structure is so, you know what I'm saying? It's in the culture of education. And so me understanding like from the beginning, I don't know nothing. My kids 
know more than me. My kids' community can teach me how to teach them. And so who am I to come in and be like, I know everything, and that's my stance, and that even if I am wrong, I have no chance to you know, break that and to learn something else different, right? But I think it, it, it depends on the context. It depends on what's needed. It depends on the district. It depends on the board. It depends on the disparities. It depends on so many different things. So I think this is going to be fun because I think that we can definitely bring different perspectives because I personally, and I think a lot of the teachers that, you know, follow the channel feel like they've been burned, not just burned, but toasted, roasted, and thrown out the window by a lot of these new policies. And it's so hard because I've set in professional development where I'm like, okay, all right, like I could see this, but then in the classroom, it doesn't seem to actually work. And so yeah. that's really been my challenge. And so let's start by just defining what does equity mean to you? And what are some practical applications of how that might show up in the classroom for you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so, you know, equity obviously is different from equality. You know, you have that great picture where you have the three kids standing on the sign and one kid can see because he's tall and the other one can't see. And they're talking about that's uh, equality, right? They're both at the game, you know, but equity is giving everything with, you know, giving everyone what they need. You know what I'm saying? It's literally it, giving each kid what they need in a social emotional way, in an academic way, in a loving way, right? You're just understanding that if I'm teaching, right, in the Bronx, right, and I have a plethora of diverse Latinx, uh, excuse me, Latino kids, I have to understand that all kids that are in Latin America are not from one country. I have to understand that kids are from El Salvador, El Salvador. They're from Honduras. They're from Dominican Republic, right? You understand what I mean? And I have to, as teachers, I have to be able to differentiate what are the linguistic differences? What are the kinesthetic differences between them? I am in deeply, I am deeply entrenched into the so sociology of my students. And so as I'm getting my national board certification right now, that is the number one question I have to write about. How are you being equitable? And it's the hardest question because if you don't have a great relationship with your teachers, your teacher mind and your kids, you're just, you're just lying. You know what I'm saying? You're just pulling stuff from flies. And then you get into the mindset of like, this is hard. I don't want to do it, right? And then you start leaving. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because it's so hard. But then I don't blame the teachers that is leaving because the infrastructure is not in place. That makes sense. Yeah, I guess the problem that I encounter personally, you can be my therapist today, Mr. Nellum. You're just, it's going to be like a teacher therapy reverse. Here, here was my problem. So I felt like I had students that would make excuses about why they couldn't meet the standards. And I felt like, let's say when I taught middle school and I had maybe 120 students, I felt like it's totally impossible for me to know the life story of every student, you know, I think in a general sense, we might know some if they have like special needs or a 504 plan, things like that we're expected to know. But then there's the preferences of certain students. And then there's the sensitivities of other students. And then there's the relationship dynamics between the kids that this kid doesn't want to sit with this kid. You know, this kid loves um, auditory learning and loves to hear me talk. This kid wants to collaborate. This kid wants to draw pictures. And by the end of the day, I felt like I'm constantly getting professional development on differentiation and on all these different modalities of teaching and learning and how I need to be more, you know, culturally responsive and I need to be, you know, more inclusive and I need to be um, somebody that's constantly changing up every single thing. And it seems completely impossible. So when it came down to it, I ended up feeling like I could never set a standard in the room. I couldn't set a standard as simple as, you know, the kind of old fashioned now, like Harry Wong model, where there's a do now on the board, students enter silently, they sit down at their desk and they get started. It would feel like the most simple procedures and practices, like I just couldn't establish it because the kids just wouldn't do it. And it felt like everybody had a different reason of why they couldn't do it. Or if yeah. an administrator came in and, you know, kids look bored, they'd say, oh, this, you know, it looks like they're bored. You need to change it. You need to be like, not literally dancing at the beginning of the class, but yeah. you need to be hooking them. You need to be, you know, doing an anticipatory set. And it just goes right. on and on and on and on. And then at the end of the day, I'm like, what did, what did the kids have to do? 
what do they need to bring to the table? They're not doing their homework. They're not following the lecture. They've got all this technology and they are FaceTiming each other. <laughs> like it ended up feeling like the teacher is on an endless hustle, an endless hamster wheel. And it felt like the kids are bringing nothing. But when we would all sit down with the administrator, it was somehow all the teachers fall. So, you know, therapy me, Mr. Nellum, like yeah. what, where am I going wrong here? Right. Absolutely. And so it's all up within this, the reflection of what you know, what your kids can bring and what you're producing in your lesson plan. So if I'm getting evaluated from my admin and they're telling me I'm a two because I'm not getting 100 percent engagement. Right. Because that's real. In order for you to get a four, you have to get 100 percent engagement. And some teachers, they're like, what? 100 percent engagement for 40 kids? How can I get 100 percent engagement? You telling me if I don't got 80 percent engagement, that's not a four. That's actually a four to me. You know what I mean? But then you have admin that are like, no, I want 100 percent. Right. And so you have to be, be honest with yourself as the teacher. You have to be the quote unquote word. You have to be reflective. Right. And then when they're making you a three, you have to make sure you have to understand, do I have the evidence to prove that I'm actually a four? And you have to self-advocate. What you're saying is true, but it's needed, though. We need culturally responsive teaching. We need equity based teaching. We need trauma informed teaching because white supremacy and racism. The reality is that we can't do that because you pay me $40,000 a year. But you'll do it if it was $100, $120,000 a year, though. The lawyer gets paid to do that because that sounds like what lawyers do, right? They, they got all these cases and they got to know the case between a different case and they got to differentiate the case between a different case. That sounds like a lot, but we do that every day. You know what I'm saying? But we getting paid thirty five, forty, six thousand dollars $60,000 to do it. And it's like, no, I rather, you know what I'm saying? And so the reality of it, it's not where it needs to be, but we need to make sure that we're pushing these things because they're needed. And so I always go back to our ancestors. You know what I'm saying? Our ancestors did it when we had segregation. You know what I'm saying? Our ancestors were... You know what I'm saying? Right when, you know, Emancipation Proclamation happened, we had the greatest acquisition in literacy amongst ex-slaves because during slavery, slaves were teaching each other. They had their own schools. So there's no excuse, right? You know what I'm saying? Yes, it is hard. Yes, we are tired. But our people have done that. And we have to look back and pass and figure those things out. Well, I agree with you 100%. But I think of that in terms of the students and the families. Because yeah. in a lot of ways, I think of teaching is kind of like a weird codependent relationship where one partner, you know, the teacher in this case is like doing great and being told you're not doing good enough. And so they're better and they just continue improving and they're working so hard. But the other party, a lot of times the students and their families are doing nothing. And they're saying, you know what, I'm incapable of doing what I'm supposed to do because you're not good enough. And so the teacher is sweating more and more and more. And so my exact thoughts are, you know, why is it I've heard at least that even during segregation, like you said, there were students that were performing on par with their white peers in schools with less resources. And the question I have to ask myself was, there more of a cultural value on education at that time where the parents pushing their students to excel and to work hard and to use the resources that they have. Whereas I see now, I feel as if, you know, especially during the pandemic, we did all of these pushes to make sure everybody had iPads. We provided internet. We provided everything. We were bringing meals to people's houses and they still wouldn't even log in to do their homework, but the district could see them logging in to watch YouTube. To me, that's not a problem of racism. That's a problem of values. They were valuing, you know, other things above their education. Whereas I've seen students come from Nigeria and absolutely excel and do so well because their parents are really pushing hard for them to value their education and do their work. And so that's where I really get stuck with a lot of the modern conversations, because I think without any kind of sense of individual responsibility and pushing students on an individual level and holding families accountable, there are certain things that are within our local of control and we can change. And then there's things that may take four more decades to change. And yeah. so that's just why I get stuck with um, a lot of the modern professional development. It's not that there's no truth in it, but it's just that it doesn't actually have a bearing necessarily on what students are valuing. Does that kind of make sense? And there's no connection to the community, right? You know, it's just like the next popular term that comes out, right? You know, but again, it's still needed, right? And just because it's not popular, just because it's not easy, 
doesn't mean it's not needed. You know what I mean? It just means that you might need to be in a position to do it, right? I might need to be in a position to lead it, you know? And also, I wouldn't say that the parents don't value the education. It's just like, if you talk about it, right, we're just not talking about anti-racist education in the last five years. You know what I'm saying? We're just talking about these things. So that means this system has been long when their parents were in school. So that means that their parents probably have a bad relationship with an education system that their students are currently now in that we're saying is crumbling. And we're saying that their parents don't care. Now we can't say that. We have to say like, what is your relationship with the education system and how do we heal that? How do we restore that? You understand what I mean? Because there's so much hurt and trauma that's been dealt. Wouldn't you agree? That's tough. I definitely can see ways in which there's a distrust for the educational system, for sure, among a lot of, you know, families and communities. I definitely get that. But I think perhaps there's a lack of correlation between decisions and results. And that's the part where I really, really struggle because, you know, yeah. I don't think like, you can tell me if you think I'm wrong, but systemic racism doesn't make me play Fortnite for three hours instead of studying for my test. Systemic racism, you know, doesn't necessarily make me, when I'm given a device, when we're using vocabulary and culturally responsive curriculum, when we're reading a book from a Black author, when the teacher is Black, like, you could yeah. do all of those things. And yeah. then if the student then on, on their part, don't fulfill their part of the partnership because it's not necessarily a value or it's not something that they feel motivated to do. To me, that's where it falls flat because I really feel like I did my very best to try and do all the changes that I was being told I should do. And so that's just where I get really frustrated because I think that it's something that's so kind of like ethereal and abstract that it ends up sounding great in a professional development. But when yeah. we're in class at eight in the morning and nobody did their homework, nobody's doing the work that they have now, nobody's really even trying and they're just playing. To me, that's where it breaks down. I think it's that 50-50 partnership again. It's like, yes, schools can work to make sure that you know, systems and structures are fair. Schools can yeah. work to make sure that teachers are being sensitive and understanding of different cultures. There's so many things that the school can do, but at the end of the day, what happens when we've done all that we can do, at least like you said, without the, you know, infrastructure and the money and the time and the resources, and now it's the student's turn to do their work. Now it's the student's turn to stop acting up in class. Like that's to me where it all breaks down. And that's why I almost, um, I almost feel tired already of like hearing these buzzwords because it makes me feel like not saying it's a conspiracy or anything, but it makes me feel like this is a way that administration can feel really noble about themselves and they can win all of the, you know, contests, so to speak, and they can put all of these things on their district report card, yet the outcomes are getting worse for students. As we take away old, you know, traditional structures and standards and expectations, the students are scoring worse. Less students are coming to school. There's more violence within the building. So I yeah. want to know how is that helping the Black community if our outcomes are getting worse the more that we implement some of these ideas? Yeah, you know, and I just was like, just real quickly ask you, like, you know, when you were in the, you know, when you were in teaching, was it like all your classes that were like that? Or was it a percentage of your classes? that were similar to the way you described? That's interesting. I would say behavior-wise, 80% of my kids were doing well at any given time. I would say depending on the day, there could be 20%, you know, that could be like five or six kids that were, I don't know what was going on with them that day. And normally I could manage it. So I would say behavior didn't tend to be my biggest problem. It was apathy, a lack of motivation, a lack of doing work, a lack of turning in assignments. And that's what really frustrated me because as you know, and every Every teacher in America knows it's all about the data and it's all about the scores and standardized tests and all of these things, especially coming from Teach for America and having my start in charter schools. So there's yeah. all this pressure on hard numbers and data. But yeah. yet I'm being told, you know, oh, well, you need to change all of these things that would produce those outcomes. And so for me, it reminds me all the time of somebody saying, I want my child to be an Olympic level athlete. Yet they yeah. won't go to the gym. They won't do their power squads. They won't eat healthy. It's just to me, this fantasy world of so many things being expected and asked of teachers, but the bar getting lower and lower for students. 
I don't know if that answered your question or not. No, it's okay because like I just really appreciate you allowing me to come on your platform because I really hope that this conversation was gonna be in this direction, right? And so like the reason I asked that question, right? Because it's not it's not all bad, right? It's it's a percentage. And I think now, like what my brother Major always tells me, is like we have more kids that like that it's like that percentage has increased now, right? Because of so many other things that we talked about. So it's like a competition of attention. It's a competition between the attention on the cell phones, it's a competition between attention on the games, a competition on between attention between the parents, competition between you. And we have to fight for that competition because we know from recent news reports that algorithm bias is real mm -hmm. and algorithms can be manipulated. That's oh, why yeah. TikTok has been such a big controversy now, right? Oh, so, yeah. so that's another reason. So that's, that's systemically, right? That's another reason why we have to also understand that it's not all bad, right? And when we recognize recognize it's not all bad and we use the data we understand that i have 40 percent of kids that reach mastery of the objective and i have to live with that and i have the other 60 percent that did and next year i'm gonna try to make sure i get 65 percent. and as the educator as the reflective as the practitioner as the artist as the master teacher we have to give ourselves grace and live with that right because we are our worst critics we can have the amazing day 90% and then one kid can literally mess up that entire day and that can literally destroy our day. Tell me no. That's true, but let me keep it real with you. If my administrators graded me like that oh, and was oh, like, oh, Miss oh, Trish, oh, let oh, me just oh, give oh, you oh, grace, girl. I would be like, yes. Oh, no, oh, they're oh, like, oh. failure. <laughs> Yes, but real quick though, but say take that, right, and scale it. So we, 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 it's perfection in everything, right? It's our observation. It's in the, how we respond to our parents when we try to call them over a behavior issue. We take it so, we internalize it because we are never filling in our cups, you know what I mean? And because it's take, taking so much. And so I understand everything you're saying, sis, you know what I'm saying? And that's why we have to, that's why we're doing what we're doing. Because I hope you can continue doing what you're doing, but hope take something that what I'm doing and you continue to maybe, you know, just keep keep the message alive because there are teachers out here that are crying out for help. But then there are teachers out here that are doing work and they're doing it well and they're doing it with a smile on their face, right? And we also got to give credit to that. So it's just all about, right, you know, coming together and figuring out who's doing it right. And I think with the admin issue, right, it's all about the principal. You know what I'm saying? You have to inspect your principal. You have to inspect your admin. You're getting evaluated. You have to make sure you are your best best advocate and no one's trying to manipulate you because they're 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 like sharks out there, you know? But I think what's changing though, sis, what's changing though, Trish, is that the value in the educator is becoming more and more now because the teacher shortage is getting it's getting it's getting it's getting worse. And we need teachers. And those admin, they not <laughs> they not as value. I'm just playing, I'm just playing. They all value. But what I'm trying to say is like it's coming. We just gotta stay strong. We gotta keep working. We gotta go back to our history. You know what I'm saying? Because it's gonna get worse if we don't. I guess I mean, look what's happening in Florida. What's happening in Florida? I, I kind of fast from the news from time to time. I mean what the what they're doing they're changing they're 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 making things that allow liberation and they're caught they're putting negative connotations to it and that is not equity we already talked about how the pandemic talk it showed us why equity is important right george floyd brought us all together no matter black white or nothing right and so imagine if we look past our colors and we actually invest in education we're not investing in education tris so that's why it's so messed up. We have sharks and admin that are literally power struggle or narcissists and using that just because they can and taking advantage of teachers. And we have teachers that don't self-advocate and it's just like a festival for them. But that's why we have, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> El Mecky. That's why we have the Eight Black Hand podcast. That's why we have, you know, people that are doing the work, right? You know, um, um, just so many, so many people, uh, the, Dr. Patini Love, Goldie Muhammad, uh, 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 just Dr. Chris Emden, you know, they're, they're doing the work and they can can tell you right now they are a dime of a dozen they are the only ones doing it. and they're outcasts in their field too i guarantee you they'll let you know that they'll they'll never they'll never regret their decisions though they're not scared of nothing you know like you you imagine being scared in education in the field where we were we we're we're giving ourselves and we have to worry about politics are you serious you telling oh, me I, I gotta navigate differentiation and then navigate politics like i'm working in a white house when i'm getting paid forty five thousand dollars a year you telling me that's fair to me? No, that's not fair to me. And any teachers that's dealing with that, that's not fair to you and you deserve better. I think it's interesting though, because some people would argue <laughs> that a lot of the, the things on the side of like, you know, critical race theory and equity and, you know, social emotional learning and a lot of the new pushes, many people would argue that that is political in and of itself and that it is infiltrating. So how would you respond to people that have that view? Why? And then I'll ask them, define those things. 
and then tell me why. Why are there controversies? Yeah, I think that a lot of people have some concerns about the really radical changes that have started to happen in the last, I don't know, maybe, would you say five years or so, with the really intense divide among political parties and, and factions of people. And some people feel as if the race conversation isn't always coming up in a way that's healthy and helpful. And so I have questions myself only because of the way that I've seen it done. And, you know, I set in professional developments where they said, you know, let's identify whiteness so we can find ways to eradicate it. And there was, you know, people that were white that were a little bit like, okay, what? <laughs> you yeah. know? And so I do understand how that is very different from some of the traditional mindsets that we've had in education that didn't necessarily focus on race. And so I do think it's hard too, because I know that a lot of people have had concerns and fears even that with, you know, talking so much about, you know, racism and white supremacy and systematic racism, that students are going to end up feeling like they're in a place of victimhood, that they're in a place of oppression, when in 2023, Many students have more opportunities, like we talked about earlier, than their ancestors ever did. There's so many scholarships, there's so many funds, there's so many companies that are actually looking for Black interns and Black students. And so a lot of the, the things that I've heard at least talked about a lot is, again, without some of the individual responsibility pieces, you can give students, you know, spots at a university, a scholarship, you can give them an internship. But if through their schooling experience, they didn't develop values like, you know, being punctual, turning in work on time, grit, getting assignments done, uh, being respectful to their teachers, then they're going to find themselves in positions that they can't sustain. And that's been a real, that's been a real fear that I've had, because yeah. I do think that there is a danger somewhat in developing a victim identity. And so the way I've always approached uh, racial issues before I was getting professional developments on it yeah. is, when I could, I would be honest with when I taught, you know, all black students that, you know what, there are people that are going to look at you because of the color of your skin and believe negative things about you. How are we going to prove them wrong? There are places in the world today where girl students are denied the ability to learn how to read because they're girls. How are we going to make sure that we are taking our privileges to have books and resources seriously? Um, but instead, as the years have passed on, I feel like I've seen a lot of entitlement and a lot of internalized, embraced, and prized victimhood where it's producing more excuses than it is empowerment. And there's a mentality that, oh, the teacher is never doing enough. Or, oh, if I get in trouble in this class, it's because the teacher is racist. And so I do think it's very difficult to have an age-appropriate conversation sometimes yes. about some of these really deep issues right. without students misunderstanding it. And so I do think that some people that have some questions about, you know, some of the critical race theory, you know, conversations, it's based on some of those fears, not just because they're like, oh, I'm tired of hearing about Black people. What do you think about that? And I would just say, you know, for people that are scared of that, it's just all about how well read are you, you know? And like just authors, I'll recommend, you know, just to allow you to be more well read is Dr. Ben, Dr. Henry. Henry Clark, you know, um, um, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. Um, those are just a few authors that can give you just a great understanding of where all this is coming from, right? You know, um, but it's just all about like being well read, right? But then also understanding it's about right and wrong, doing the Dr. Patini Love. It's about humans, right? It's about doing what's right for humans. It's about what's doing what's right for kids. And if kids are, 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 or, or excuse me, if kids are protesting or, or advocating because they are being heard, then we have to listen to that. And that is what equity is saying. It's saying, just listen to it. That's it. Don't brush it off as nothingness. You know what I'm saying? Then the equity is also mutual too. So it's the same thing for the teachers as well, right? And I think with uh, teachers, right? I think, again, right? It's all about power, right? We have to be able to relinquish some of that power and understand that our kids can allow us to teach these classes better, right? Our kids can allow us to facilitate these classes better because 
you know, is 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 more is this us and then it's them too, right? Um, and then again with the parents, right? It's just again recognizing that they have power too. I think sometimes as teachers, we try to take the role as the parent, and that can be a burdensome, right? And we kind of like don't even get the parent really involved, but we take on the burdens of the parent. We with the kid more we with the kid most of the time, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right? And it is not until that parent teacher conference come up, and I guarantee you this year has been the worst year where I've had my my worst year with like my communication with parents because I've just been so busy with things. But then whenever I have that conversation with them, I first apologize. I humble myself and I say, I am I say, I apologize for my lack of communications. Your child's future is the most important thing to me. And I would do my best, right? To try to communicate. And you you think I did my best the next time? I tried, but I probably messed up again too. You know what I'm saying? But like it's about it's about giving yourself that grace too. And talking to the parents and letting them understand, like, I'm not gonna do, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be perfect, but I'm really gonna try, you know what I'm saying, to fight for your kids. And so again, you know, it shouldn't be all on us, it should be on the system to allow us to do the, all these things that we're saying, right? But like we're saying, we're not, we're not, it's not, it's not there, you know, but it will eventually, right? And we have to, we have to keep fighting for that. And then I guess to act to the victim thing, again, I would say take it with a grain of salt, right? If people are saying they're victims, maybe they're lying, but maybe 1% of them have some type of ability. We should look into that 1% and understand where is that coming from and then investigate that. And if there's validity and there's an investigation and we understand what it is and it's truthful in that, then we can go back and reevaluate. But I think it's all about just making sure we're listening to everybody. We're not feeling like we're power, more, more powerful over everybody and just giving ourselves grace, man, because this job is hard. And giving yourself grace is more than just like a saying. It just means like take a deep breath and understand that if you didn't get it done today, you can get it done tomorrow. So I, I think I, I see the authority thing a little bit differently and it could be, you know, I don't know if it's just me <laughs> that has had a hard time, you know, getting students to be respectful and to actually listen to what I'm saying. But to me, if the teacher doesn't have authority, you don't have a classroom. And I think youth brings with it a little bit of a know-it-all attitude anyway, no matter the generation, the time, you know, the place, that's just youthfulness. Why youth though? This is, the, this is the generation that protests. Do you know that? You know, they were protesting in George Floyd. We weren't. They were out there in the street protesting justice. They were the ones that changed things. The, our kids are beyond powerful, right? But we have to understand that they have to, right? They have to slow down, right? They can't just be all power and willy-nilly and reckless. They have to have some type of, you know, finesse. They have to be cool, calm, and collect. And that's where we come in, right? But we have to recognize that they do have a lot to say. They're the most computer literate. They're going to be the ones that's going to be most advanced using AI. We have to, we have to, we have to, we have to recognize that potential and not take it as, because listen, my kids don't listen to me. They wasn't listening to me today, sis. They won't listen to me today. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But that's me. I have to be reflecting and be like, okay, let me put on a Lorax then. Instead of me talking about biodiversity, I'm going to watch, put on a movie about the uh, biodiversity. And guess what? They, they were, they, they, uh, they got that part though. You see what I'm saying? And so it's just understanding like it's different ways. It's the way, it's the art. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I just think we we might be forgetting the fact that kids will take advantage of this. I think we're expecting kids to be yeah, very, cool. yeah, to be very like fair and understanding. Take advantage of that too. So just make sure that you outsmart them. <laughs> That's kind of hard though that it, it feels like in this new system, maybe in the old system, it felt like the teacher had all the power. But now yeah. it feels like the teacher has no power and nobody um, wants to hear the teacher's voice. Everybody's oh, everywhere hearing. else. That's all. We have Say other what? stakeholders. We just have other stakeholders and we have to use them. We have to make sure we're using our reading specialists. We have to make sure we're using our math specialists. We have to make sure we're using our culture specialists. We have to make sure we're using our restorative pressures. Going back to what I was saying, perfectionism. We feel like we can do it all. So we don't reach out for help. That's a problem for teachers. I didn't, I feel like I really did reach and I actually got burned by that too because I'm I thought that I could help people. I'm sorry that happened. I'm really sorry that happened. Yeah, I just, it's just interesting um, because I, I get hundreds of messages from other teachers that have had similar experiences and I just, I, I don't see things getting better with a lot of the new ideologies and the new pushes, I see the outcomes getting worse because I think at the end of the day, you know, students need to know how to respect the teacher. They need to know how to follow directions. 
They need to know how to cope when a lesson's boring. That was most of our college experiences. They need to know how to, you know, read literature that maybe is outside of their culture. Maybe it is from a different time period. And I've been in situations where I raised over a thousand dollars to get um, the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. And after doing all that work and getting all the curriculum and having the kids fall in love with the series, I was told, oh, that's an old white guy. We don't, we don't want that, you know. And, and you should have said, and you should have said, no, this white guy inspired me as a black girl growing up. And that can empower them just as much. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. We have to fight against that because listen, Narnia, I love that movie. I watched both of those movies. There's some equity isn't just blackness. It's everything, right? It's it's understanding that because the reason why we started talking about blackness, because blackness or ant or anything that was dealing with BIPOC was not being heard because most of it was driven towards predominantly white black excuse me excuse me predominantly male context books history right so we have to say that yo we're tired of that because it's just it's more things out there we want to broaden our minds right but then what's happened is that as soon as we start talking about the black stuff they started saying that's negative you know what i'm saying why why is it negative why is it controversy it's just the book you know what i'm saying it's just a perspective it's another it's another it's another way to, to, to understand something. But that doesn't mean pro-blackness is anti-whiteness and pro-whiteness isn't anti-blackness. They're, they're all needed. Do you see how though, when teachers sit in a workshop and are told to identify whiteness and brainstorm how to eliminate it, that could be hard. And when even a black teacher is having all of her work undone because yes, the guy is white. Thing to do. That's a very <laughs> hard thing to do, sis. But I would I was tell you though, it's needed. We, which we part have to we have to what you say what's hard. Like no, which part is needed? I think that's what that's kind of why I asked analyzing for our part. privilege in this world that we live in, whether if you're white, black, analyzing it, understanding the identity aspect, understanding the power that comes with that, and understanding your privilege that comes with that. That's what it means. That's all it means. It's needed to understand that because you understand that, then you can understand other marginalized communities that don't have those privileges. And when we recognize that power, then we're able to be more equitable. But if we get caught up in the uncomfortable part, we won't learn. We have to be uncomfortable to learn. And I guarantee you, when my wife told me I was a misogynist at one point, or I did something that was misogynistic, I was hurt. I was like, what, me? And then I had to reflect and was like, yeah, that probably was misogynistic. You know what I mean? But but I had to recognize my privilege as a male in society. And I do have privilege as a male in society. You understand what I mean? And understand what misogyny is. You know, even through this course of the journey, I had to understand, you know, see, see what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it's not not about the anti proness it's about just the individual reflection and what are you are you doing that work are you really doing that work and the people around you doing that work because if you're really doing that work it's going to be infectious and other people are going to eventually start to do that work too if you're not doing that work then it's not going to work out i can guarantee you that the work that i'm trying we can do all the white supremacy work and we can still get poor test scores but i can still guarantee you that i'm happy that we did those work though because that work is going to be needed to get those high test scores because it steps to it it steps to it. it takes time but it steps to it i i have a lot of different thoughts um i do think that there is a propensity for people to kind of take the easiest shortest route and end up like making something something it wasn't meant to be because i remember sitting in one of those workshops yeah, and, uh, <laughs> I said, yeah those are called scammers <laughs> well, i don't even know if they're meaning to because this lady literally told me that i was culturally white and that I have internalized whiteness and it was she kind of said it in a way that was like oh you poor thing <laughs> she was like you are culturally white and I was like what what are you talking and, about and then, and then what what happened after that I didn't know what to say I was floored I I didn't know where to go from there because I think a lot of the the issues people have is when you say do the work somebody else is defining what the work is for you you, and if you have questions, there tends to be a cosmic fly swatter that comes down and whacks people. And I think that that is what was really hard, yeah. the way things are framed. It seems as if when people disagree with the premise in some of these workshops or in some of these books, it is very poorly looked upon. So I'm just trying to think off the top of my head, 
We did a professional development book. Um, I've had to go through this book a couple of times. You know, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? And there was a lot of really interesting points in the book. But one of the points was that black people can't be racist. And I personally disagreed with that. But I feel like I was sort of chastised for having that position because I believe that racism is something that is in somebody's heart. It's in their belief system. It's in their psyche. It's something where they either feel like they have um, supremacy over another group or they feel um, that another group is inferior or they have a hatred or an anger or even like negative predisposed uh, thoughts about a certain group. Those are things that anybody can have. Um, but that was kind of strange for me. Or I've been in workshops where the premise of the workshop was that the reasons for Black students failing to succeed was actually the unconscious bias and internalized racism of the teachers. And to me, that felt like just another way to slap teachers in the face, especially teachers, you know, that they could be working in suburban schools, they could be getting a higher salary, but they actually choose to work in an urban context because they care about the kids. And then they're being told that their unconscious bias and internalized racism, even if they don't realize it, is actually what's causing the disparities in the classroom. And then again, you have like a teacher like me that's saying, okay, now I'm getting blamed, you know, because my students aren't doing their work, they're not turning in their assignments. So for me, it was this constant ideological pull between knowing that there are conversations that have value, but seeing the outcomes of my students not get better. And knowing that, you know, 25 years ago, perhaps, you know, some students that looked like me were getting A's, they were getting into colleges. And now a lot of students that look like me are doing worse as a lot of these policies come to pass. And it just made me kind of feel like I'm not sure if this is having the benefit that people think it's having, if it's not improving the outcomes, and if it's not teaching students how to survive in the real world by having character. That's really how I felt. I felt I listened to um, another professional development of the author of the book, I believe it's maybe called um, Push Out, you know, the criminalization of black girls, I can't remember the exact title. But I was really upset when I felt like she implied that, you know, a student that cusses at the teacher and shows anger, like, oh, that's a part of their culture. And we shouldn't get upset about the defiance. And oh, like, maybe we need to talk about it. And maybe we need to self reflect. And I've just seen so many any of these policies and these ideologies effectively make students not accountable for their behavior at all. And I'm actually thinking that's worse for black and brown students. I'm thinking, you know, when they mouth off to a cop and don't respect authority, like that's not going to turn out well. I'm thinking if they happen to be like, let's say in a region of the United States that has racial problems and they're unable to show up on time, they're unable to get their work assignments turned in, they pop off and have a huge attitude because all of that was excused and even praised in school, they're not going to do better. Like this is not better for our people. Like I rewatched um, the movie Hidden Figures again and I was just astounded at actual overt racism and the way those women had to carry themselves, the dignity, the poise, the tenacity, the unwillingness to give up, the being excellent. You know, some people call it the black tax, you know, having to be like perfect at a job and not make any mistakes. And I'm thinking these character traits were bred into Black children because they didn't want their kid to encounter a racist police officer that was going to hurt them. They didn't want their student to be, you know, in a college classroom and have the professor have a reason to have something negative to say. And so I'm feeling as if in this shift and putting all of the focus on institutions and your teachers internalized racism and ways you're being oppressed and different kinds of ways that you're a victim and none of the focus on character, integrity, hard work, punctuality, in some places, like I want to say it might have been the Smithsonian, they were actually saying that those characteristics were white. And some of that came up in that professional development that, oh, wow, punctuality in the scientific method is white. Like that should make you mad, Mr. Nellum. You're a scientist. The, scienti the scientific method isn't white. So do you kind of see where I'm coming from? I think that's where the concerns are coming from 
from the other side, not just like, oh, they don't want to hear about black people. You see where I'm coming from? I think, again, you know, and could you repeat the question real briefly? Yeah, I was just curious, like, with all of these policies that are not having better outcomes for students, and sometimes are actually praising negative characteristics that students are displaying, like, I want to know how that's helping black kids be prepared for the real world. And when you hear things like from some of these, <clears throat> you know, different race theorists, that say things like the scientific method is white and punctuality is something that's a part of white culture. So we need to re-navigate how we teach these things and how we expect these things. To me, that is racist against Black people. Does that kind of make sense a little bit? I think I think if we just keep it simple, right? Dr. Uh, Kunjufu, uh, Kwanzaa Kunjufu, um, he said, no matter if it's white supremacy, racism that's present, segregation, police brutality, if you have high expectations for your kids, your kids are going to perform. Right. You know, no matter if you're white, black, Asian, Indian teacher, if you have high expectations for your scholars, they're going to perform. If you, you know, do research on pretty much just the scores between um, black kids and segregated schools in the South during segregation time compared to, you know, the opposite, you'll find that their scores were tremendously like they were high. They were up, up to par with the white kids and what they found in the research, they found that when you have those same standards, right, that you set for the whatever class that you say is the privileged class, those kids can reach to that standard too, right? But the reality is that it is not the same. You know, we started a podcast and I told you in Virginia, my education system is different than it is in Detroit. Yeah. Too different. Wouldn't you agree? Oh yeah, and, I had that experience too, switching and, states as a kid. And then in Louisiana, Louisiana education was way different than Virginia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's it's not universally working for everyone because the disparities are so big. Mm -hmm. And that's what the pandemic showed us, right? We gave everybody laptops, which was equality, but Fs went down the roof in every category, in every socioeconomic status, right? Because yeah. kids can just learn through a screen, no matter if you white, black, green, rich, poor, or whatever. Books, the books that we're talking about or any book that may be uh, giving power to a marginalized group is needed for white kids, Asian kids. It's needed for everybody. A black male teacher isn't just needed for black students. That's also needed for white teach white kids too. You know what I mean? Vice versa, right? It's the recognizing the value in everything and walking in that. We don't walk in that. At my school, we walk in that. At my school, we have white, black, Asian, whatever teachers you want. I, we teach at an all black school and I guarantee you we teach our kids out of straight love and no matter what what we would look like we are hardworking good teachers we have almost five teachers that have gotten nationally board are getting nationally board certified you understand what I mean we have a we went from a zero tolerance school to a equity based school over a five year process we we've gained scholarships to to get more teachers retention we we've done things that are transformative and it's been in an all white all black staff and we've had these conversations we've done the the conferences we've had the tough conversations we've lost people because of that and all i'm saying is is that you have to give it time and if it's if 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 you're saying that it's not working for black kids we have to find something that's going to work for those black kids but i'm going to tell you that all black kids ain't the same we're not a monolith right and so it may work for some black kids and it definitely ain't gonna work for all black kids. So we gotta figure out what work for other ones. Because I guarantee you, when I took my kids outside, I had 30% of the kids doing the work. I had 30% of the kids kind of doing the work. And I had the other 40 playing on the swings. <laughs> you know what I mean by that? Yeah. It's you get, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. And I think we can agree on one point you said for sure, that we need to have the same standards high, high, high standards for Black kids. And that's the very argument that I'm making. I have heard in a lot of these equity conversations, the idea that because the statistics are different in negative ways for Black students than white students, essentially we need to take away that criteria, not bring students up to the criteria that other students are meeting. So for example, you know, they might say that Black students are getting suspended three times more than white students so we don't say, why is that happening? Are there any behavior issues that need to be addressed? Are there any underlying issues? We just say, okay, we're not going to suspend anybody. And a lot of schools we were seeing, you know, the failure rate is higher among Black students. Okay, so now everybody just passes. They're saying that's yeah, equity. That failed. 
And a lot of people found out that that failed and they went right back to those systems or they did a diversion of those systems or they kept equity in the mindset and they recognized that we can't go back to just suspending kids and giving them detention every single time. We got to make sure that we do something a little bit different. We have to have restorative. If they if something happens, we got to restore it right quick. Boom, boom, boom. Don't nip it in the bud. Right quick. Don't let it linger. We have to give them time. And then when they come back at the restorative justice, you have to treat them as if they didn't do nothing and give them equality and don't give them a reputation. What happens is, is we put people put labels on kids because of their, you know what I'm saying? Just, be, just them being products of the environment, so them having a bad day or them cussing you out because it's just them being kids, right? You know, the John Morant situation. He is a kid. He's 23 years old. I mean, he's a young kid and he is irresponsible and he's going to deserve and get what he got, right? And just like a lot of our kids, right? We have to allow them to make the mistakes. You made mistakes when you was 23, right? And so our kids are definitely are not going to get it right when we put the equity-based stuff in it. You got teachers that can go through a white supremacy uh, workshop and still go into the classroom and still be ineffective. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, it, it's not, it just, it, just because you go through the workshop, that doesn't mean that it's going to allow you to just be effective, right? It's, it's so many things that's needed to be a good teacher. You know what I'm saying? This stuff is hard. And so what I'm saying is, Take it with a grain of salt. If it doesn't apply to you, throw it away with it. Take what applies to you and make you teaching them kids. Make sure that mastery is getting above 50%. I would say and work on, work on, right? Work on social emotional learning, right? Work on when you see your kids, right? And you see that they're trying or you see that they're struggling, just during ask them like, yo, how you doing? And come down to them. Because I've had a depression year. A lot of my kids have had depression year. And I guarantee you, it was therapy when we had those conversations. Like, yeah, how you doing? Mr. Nell, you like you have being sad today. I actually am sad today. Why are you sad today? Because, you know, my, they're not listening to me. It's okay, Mr. Nell. It's going to get better. All right, it will get better tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? Just like having those moments with your kids, right? Being real. Just just being with your kids. No matter if you're teaching black kids, no matter if you're teaching white kids, no matter if it's, you know what I'm saying? Have the human element. Teach effectively every single day. Lesson plan. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And if you have a admin who is a shark, get out that school. Yeah, I... I went through five schools in eight years. I went to yeah, charter, right. public, private. I tried There's every socioeconomic I found my school. There's a school for you. I found my school. You know what I mean? I That's know. a school out for everybody. I just but think that these policies aren't helpful. Like at this point, if aren't. I heard a school say that they taught restorative practices, I wouldn't be interested because I didn't see it work. I saw well, a bunch of things. You didn't see it work, but it may, doesn't mean it didn't work in that context. It doesn't mean that it's not needed. It doesn't mean that when people have a conflict, we shouldn't have some restoration so we can you know what I'm saying? Navigate with each other. You know what I mean? I just think there have consequences. And, th and there are consequences, right? And that's what I was saying, like allowing kids to make mistakes, allowing them again to make mistakes, right? Allowing them again to make the third mistake and not allowing that third mistake to be a part of reputation. Giving them grace and when they come back in the classroom, understanding like, yes, you did do those things, but I still love you, right? And bring your kid, and when I mean love, I mean like, I'm gonna give you a chance to I'm going to give you another chance. That's what I mean. I was just going to say my challenge, though, is I think a lot of these <clears throat> policies and practices aren't real life. I mean, if I get a new job yeah. and I cut somebody out one time, OK, right. you know, Miss Trish was having a bad day. I do it three times. It's not going to be this. Oh, you haven't hurt our relationship. Oh, but it I'm is real life, though. Not 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 as a teacher, even. You don't, think I mean, it's real life? you don't think there's been issues where we can't handle like issues where kids are going or people are going through stuff mentally and we mishandle those things? You don't think that's not real life? I think it's not real life for there to not be negative consequences for those things happening. And in real life, people are going to form opinions on you based off your behavior and attitude. And that Define will affect your Say what? Define negative consequence. Do you mean like going to prison? Do you mean like going to detention? Do you mean getting suspended? Do you mean getting a whooping? Do you mean getting your phone taken away? It could be any of those, depending on the context of the situation. I was thinking of jobs, you know, specifically and get fired. Oh, get fired or even like how it goes in a lot of schools. You know, if you don't respect your principal and you do something and behave in a way that's embarrassing, they get you back in other ways. They might not be able to fire you, but there's yes. a relational cost to that. Yes. And that's the difference between being a teacher and an educator. Every single day as an educator, you're going to be saying the same single thing every single day. Then I tell you to stop cussing. I promise you, it's not going to allow you to be the best you can be. You are very intelligent. I need you to work on academic language so you can keep pushing. Why you say the N-word like that? Brother, man, that doesn't give us power. We got to give each other power and give each other's brothers, sister girl, right? We want to give each other energy, right? I've had those conversations.
conversations every single day. And I guarantee you, when I tell them to stop doing it, they say, I'm sorry, Mr. Nolan. I'm sorry, Mr. Nolan. I'm sorry, Mr. Nolan. That, that means that they, they're trying and they're going to do better, but they're not going to get it the right way. But when they graduate, though, they will. If I'm there, if I'm consistent, what happens, though, Trish, right? This is what happens, Trish. This is the sad part. We get inspired to go in these communities, and we parachute in and rock the ship out. Parachute in, we come in, like, trying to save everybody. And two, three years, we rock the ship out. Five years, even five years. I tell you, a master teacher told me, you already become a master teacher until your fifth and sixth year. That really means you don't become a master teacher until your eighth year. That's really what it means. Because there's so much room for error. We have to so ask that why. First, that means your first five years <laughs> you know what i but mean we gotta ask why why do 50 percent of teachers quit in the first five years and even higher hey, in child care because of child care that's why you can't afford child care if you no. can't no it no listen if you have two kids you can't live off of you can't live off a teacher's salary it's hard that's to no, because people know the salary when they become teachers. They're not quitting necessarily. I've known teachers that quit to work at Target, not for the salary, because they're getting but treated like garbage. In the job, if the job isn't giving them the raise, the job isn't if it, if it's not if it's not going competing with the other salaries or other different job salaries. Teachers are going to feel competitive, right? And that's the problem. That's why we have to raise the base salary because there's so many other jobs that are easier, that are a lot, you know what I'm saying? Less stressful that pay twenty thousand dollars more, and we leave in a classroom just for twenty thousand dollars. When if we stay in the classroom for 10 years, that $20,000 turns to $40,000, right? Or it turns into what we wanted, but because of those experiences, because of that admin, because of a poor teacher prep program, right? Or because of just the system itself, and it is not working. I want you to acknowledge that I'm saying that, right? It's, it hasn't been working since the beginning of the beginning, right? We haven't even given it a chance. There's so many things we've been fighting to try to get to the same anti-racist curriculum. We just wanted to say those things. We just wanted to say them. Now we're saying them. We're trying to put them into some form of tangible practice. Not saying practice for everybody because it doesn't work for everybody like we already acknowledge. But we have to acknowledge that we, we what we're doing ain't working. And so we have to change something. But we can't just say like, you know what I'm saying? There's no, there's not people out here doing the work because there's people out here doing the work and they're doing it well. There's so schools out here doing the work and they're doing it well. Yeah. So I have a question for you. So you yeah. did say that even in the times of segregation, Jim Crow, black students were performing at the same levels as white students, even in their horrible truly oppressive situations and now that's plummeted do you think that that drop in scores and um, performance is due to more racism or have things become less racist in terms of Jim Crow era to 2023 I mean it, you know what they say white supremacy is just like rain right it, 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 it falls on you and you either know that it's raining on you or you don't know right and I, so I can't really answer that question but what I would say from like the college admission scandal that happened right education has become a part of this capitalistic mindset where we get degrees for value we get education for status we don't learn to learn you understand what i mean we go to colleges for the clout you know what i'm saying we get the gpa for the clout we don't we don't go to school for actual learning and so if that's the culture in america education will always be the second fifth and third fourth priority because it's just treated like any capitalistic thing that we use we use and abuse it until we don't need it no more and it is what it is but education wasn't made for that we know that it ain't a system we know that it ain't should be treated like a business and it is right but we we have to ever we have to evolve it to something different do you think that there's any cultural issues within the black community that can be improved to improve the outcomes of student performance i think there is just an issue in the education community that is performing people that are diverse learners and diverse learners come in all different shapes and colors and if you're only teaching so the sat the sat teaches primarily to linguists, excuse me, writing, English, and math skills. That's what the SAT primarily teaches. But if you read Howard, uh, Dr. Howard Gardner's multiple intelligence, you have four other intelligence that our kids are having, but we're not assessing them on those intelligence. So our assessments need to change. Our culture and assessments need to change because our kids are culturally different in learning styles. And so if we're assessing them differently, they're not gonna perform well because they're different in these assessments. So we have to diversify, think more equitably in the education system. And that's gonna benefit black kids, that's gonna benefit Asian kids, that's gonna benefit white kids, that's gonna benefit all kids when we're thinking like that. America is 45th in education in the world. Yeah, and I guess my question would be- You know what that means? You know what that means? That what? means 
the technology that has the first rank education, like China, their technology is top notch. That means that they are producing more math and science teachers and math and science wizards. They're producing the top notch technology. That means that how are we going to compete with other countries if we're 45th and only worrying about getting degrees because of status and clout? We have to evolve education and recognize that we are teaching kids because we want them to be better patriots. We want them to be able to hold an intellectual conversation and be able to distinct when someone's trying to scam you, right? We want them to think critically, right? Whenever they have something that is erroneously or a, a website that has lies in it compared to something that is based in facts, right? You know what I'm saying? I mean, we want to be able to teach kids how to, you know what I'm saying? Navigate with their language, right? Their language. We, they do that already. But teach them in a way how they can make money off of it, right? You know what I'm saying? Teach them YouTube. Like understanding the power of branding. Understanding that you, you're not, you shouldn't be scared of the AI. You should be scared of attention. It's all about whoever got the most attention. So if you can get attention from the audience, then you can beat out the AI. So be the most influential person you can be. Teach them. You imagine the power of saying that in the classroom, telling kids that be the most influential you can be, saying that, having that potential to do that. It's I'm, powerful. Yeah, I'm. I'm actually interested though that you brought up other countries because those kids in other countries aren't having like eight learning style, different lessons. They have a very traditional system, and their yeah. culture is built around achievement. Their parents put a lot of pressure on them. They study hours more than American yeah, students yeah. do. Their days are longer. And so their whole life is built around education. And I don't see that cultural value in America in general, but sadly, I really did not see it. in. I mean, we're, the, we're the biggest hypocrite, right? I mean, Russia and China always hit us with, well, you can't tell us nothing because y'all had segregation and racism. We have not, we have not done the work yet to say we are, they are they, they, those, those like you said, they already hard, but as Americans, you know, we we you know what I'm saying? We think we can just call ourselves American and not put in that extra work, right? You know, but they can automatically say, you know, y'all had segregation, y'all treated those people wrong, and America gotta swallow that, right? Because we have not written our wrongs yet. We still haven't written our wrongs. That's what equity is. We still haven't healed the harm that we've done, and we're already talking about destroying it when we haven't even healed the harm that's done, and we worrying about why pe people complaining. We haven't even healed the harm that's done. We haven't healed the harm that's done. How do you, how do you heal? Like, how could in my life? It. Okay. You have to first acknowledge it, right? And then you have to not gaslight people. When we are trying to elevate these books or whatever you want to call it, we're not trying to be gaslit. We're just trying to say there's a other way. And we're not saying that this way is better than the formal way. We're just saying that there is a other way. And this way, working with this way, might allow us to go in the right way. But right now, this one way, it ain't just, it ain't working for everybody. And so we have to figure out different ways so everyone can get to us to rank top notch. We shouldn't have the number one gun, the number one military, and have the 45th in education. That's crazy. <laughs> I think it's a culture issue, though. I think it it's all about issue. values. It is. Yeah. It is a value issue, right? But I think it's like it's 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 just like going back to what I was saying. If we can have a simple conversation about, you know what I'm saying, why you my brother and why you my sister versus my differences, then we're not going to be able to elevate the education system and get to where it needs to be. We're still going to be fighting over pennies, low hanging fruit conversation. That's where we at, low hanging fruit conversation. We not we not get into the meat of it. We just we we not get into it yet. But it takes people like you and I to bring it attention, right? Because what you're doing is amazing. You're allowing teachers to literally reflect and be heard. We're not being heard, bro. We're not being heard and we're crying through our dry faces. And when we speak, we want to we want them to be like, yo, we're being heard. But we also want them to keep moving though. We don't want them to be stagnant. We don't want them to be we don't want them to leave neither because they already leaving. Yeah, I think it's because of how we're being treated. I'm telling you though, by students, by parents, I by agree. admin, by society. I agree. I agree, but again, you know, we we if if we have to do this work, we have to do this work because this work is needed. We have to do this work because if we don't do this work, our kids, our kids won't get what's needed. And 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 yes, it doesn't come right away, you know? Um, and yes, it is rooted in faith. And you might not be a faithful person, you may not be a religious person, because I'm not, but I always have a, what's the word? If I know that I'm working with genuine people and we got a genuine mindset and we trying our best and we are 
high expectations. Good results are going to come out of that. And then we're going to reflect and try to do our best, right? You know, but we have to do this work. Work has to be done. So and if you had, it's for everybody. If you had to pick three things that are specific that would help get the work done, what would that look like for you specifically? Yeah, man. So I would say just first understanding like the people who you're ever serving right they have the power too just relinquishing that power just understanding that when i first came to detroit i came in on a mission to be humble i came here to be a better educator but i knew that my exposure to the culture will allow me to do that that's not just me reading books though that's me being in the culture me submitting myself to the culture me not over being overly you know what i'm saying out there but humbling myself and learning like Literally, literally learning. The first thing I did is I went straight to a basketball court. I tapped into my basketball side of me. And I communicated with those kids. And I communicated with those kids. And the first thing they told me was like, yo, man, we don't be on that type of stuff, man. Make sure you come next week. And I came next week. And I came the following week. And then I started learning about the Detroit culture. And I started recognizing Detroit culture is similar to the DMV culture. And I started connecting it to the Norfolk culture. I started connecting to the New Orleans culture. And then I started making parallels. And then I was like, okay, this might be home for me. You understand what I mean? Is that, but it, it took me humbleness, right? Everybody can't do that, right? But it's the it's the it's the way. It's all in how you do things. The second thing I would say, emphasize reading. Reading is everything. Our kids are not reading. They, they don't love to read. They do everything that's rooted in video. Video, no, they have to read. Annotation, summarizing the beginning, summarizing the conclusion, identifying the claim. You can do claim evidence and reasoning in any class. Every teacher is a reading teacher. I'm a STEM teacher, but I teach reading every single day. Our kids are struggling because they're not reading. They're struggling out of college because they're not reading. They have to read, okay? And then I would say that the, the third thing is just social emotional learning and that's something that i am struggling with and struggling to learn with but it's just like understanding like you know our kids are going to exceed academically but they also need we need to also teach them how to like you know what i'm saying exceed as great people how to what's some soft skills right you're talking about the soft skills the importance of punctuality the punctuality of not using profanity the, por po the importance of not using vulgarities the importance of you being kindness emphasizing those things doing workshops with those kids those the, those are what martin luther king and all of our ancestors wanted they wanted us to be in the classroom teaching kids how to be better people but i guarantee you I am not getting it right every single day. I'm getting it wrong most of the time, but I'm trying every single day. And when I get my wins, my kids are celebrating and I'm celebrating and I'm giving myself a pat on the back. And that's all you can do. And everything that we already acknowledge, if it's already crumbling and you somewhat effective, you can at least give yourself grace in that, right? Because that means that you're still pushing forward in something that's pushing back against you. I believe I'm the most powerful. I feel like I'm the most powerful because of the work that I do. And I don't mean that in like a cocky way. I mean that because... I generally give myself to my kids effectively. Try, I got, I got rated effective, so that's why I'm saying effectively. Effectively in STEM and physics. And some days I'm great, other days I'm average. I'm never not have a plan, I always have a plan. But on my best days, I'm your best math and science teacher. And that's because I, I decided to do that when I came to Detroit. And I feel like I've done that. I want teacher of the year this year. I'm getting my national board certification. And I still plan on teaching in Detroit. I've been teaching Detroit about six years. And I still feel like I still haven't learned enough. I still feel like I'm still getting started. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's just recognizing like it's a marathon, not a race. We're art right and with every art it takes time we take breaks we reflect we are worst critics we never stop doing the work thanks for sharing that you know i feel like i think your work is needed but i think like what i'm doing is also needed and i feel like we can work together but i just really appreciate the opportunity this was really great but i just really appreciate you you know what i'm saying just you know keeping it real um but i feel like i kept it real too and this was a lot of fun so thank you awesome well thank you so much for coming and you can find Calvin Nellum at the Calvin Nellum podcast. Is there anything else you want to shout out where people can find you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you can find me on all streaming platforms. Um, I'm on Patreon, Calvin Nellum podcast. Please, if you love the podcast, please make sure you subscribe to Patreon. I'm going to be teaching physics courses right now. Um, and so if you want to learn physics, please check that out. But if not, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Mr. Calvin Nellum. I just came out with a podcast on navigating identity where I talk about pretty much, you know, how I'm from like seven different places places because of Hurricane Katrina. So check that out. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Trish. This was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. And for my audience, you can ask Calvin questions in the comments. I bet he'd ha be happy to engage with you. If anybody wants to interview with me, just let me know, email me, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye for now, guys.